The dual contracts of 1913, were they a formula for success or doomed to failure from the start? Coming up. First, a, a short disclaimer. This video is not intended to be a comprehensive examination of the dual contracts, but rather a brief look into the key points and why they ultimately failed. New York opened its first subway on October 27, 1904. It was operated by the Interborough Rapid Transit Company, or IRT. It was a resounding success, and the city needed to expand the system. Several proposals were put forth, but after six years of hard negotiations, the city agreed to fund the construction of new subway lines and lease them to two private companies for operation, one of them being the IRT. The other company was the Brooklyn Rapid Transit Company, or BRT, which already operated an extensive network of surface and elevated lines in Brooklyn. The city felt that by dividing the system between these two competing entities, no single private company would have monopolistic power over the system. There were actually four contracts between the City of New York and private companies to build and operate the subways. Contracts 1 and 2 were between the city and the IRT prior to 1913. Contracts 3 and 4 were what are called the dual contracts because they were between the city of New York and two companies uh, signed in 1913. The major terms was that the contract term was 49 years from 1917. New subways and some rebuilt elevated lines were to be by, constructed by the city and leased to the companies for operation. The companies provided rolling stock, equipment, and station furnishings. It was agreed that the fare would be fixed at five cents for the term of the contracts. Ultimately, this would lead to the end of private operation. And ironically, this was something the companies actually insisted on out of fear that uh, they would be required to lower the fare as the subway became more uh, popular. Unfortunately, what they did not realize, and we will see shortly, is the inflationary spiral that was going to hit uh, the United States. The city could recapture the lines it owned and lease to the companies, and instead of rent, profits were to be shared between the city and the companies, with the exception of rental payments under contracts one and two, which continued for the IRT. For the remainder of this video, we will focus on the Brooklyn Rapid Transit Company and the effect that the contracts had on it. Uh, in 1923, the Brooklyn Rapid Transit Company was reorganized as the Brooklyn Manhattan Transit Corporation, or BMT, uh, following its bankruptcy. For more details on the history behind this reorganization and the history of the BMT, see my other video on the rise and fall of the BMT. The contracts created a mixture of city-owned lines that were leased to the BRT, uh, later BMT. Uh, from now on, for simplicity, I will just refer to the BMT. Uh, and company-owned lines that were connected to the system. The recapture provision, which allowed the city to terminate its leases after 10 years, applied only to the city-owned lines. The city would use this as a weapon to force the company to sell, as it would effectively dismember the company's operations if it was implemented. So what was supposed to happen, and how was the city and the company supposed to share profits? Well, first, after deducting operating expenses and retaining funds for maintenance and depreciation, the companies retained a preferential based on the profits they were earning on their rapid transit operations prior to entering into the contracts with the city. In the case of the 
BMT, uh, this was $3 million uh, per year that would have to be their guaranteed minimum profit. Uh, then the company retained the amount necessary to service its debt, uh, namely pay uh, interest to its bondholders. Uh, the city would then retain the amount necessary to service its debt, and if there was any remainder, it would be divided equally between uh, the city and the private company. So what went wrong? First, inflation. The contracts failed to take into consideration the inflation that followed World War I. Note how the inflation rates skyrocketed, yet the fare was limited to five cents. This failure wasn't the fault of the negotiators, as inflation as an economic concept wasn't fully understood prior to 1913. Second, the company was profitable after 1923, but that profit was at the expense of the city. Remember those preferentials? They were cumulative, meaning any deficit in company profits kept accumulating so that the profit never rose to the level that the city would share in it. Meanwhile, it had to pay interest on the money it borrowed to finance the construction of the city-owned lines. The IRT had already entered bankruptcy proceedings, but for the BMT, profits steadily declined after 1934. Then there was direct competition from the new city-owned subway, the IND, or Independent City-Owned Subway, which actually duplicated some of the BMT's routes, including running right underneath its highly profitable Fulton Street Elevated in Brooklyn. The state of New York passed a gross receipts tax, which other utilities like electric, gas, and telephone could pass along to their consumers, but because of the five cent fare being in the dual contracts, the subway companies could not. Uh, the city refused to renegotiate the fare and then began the process to recapture its lines. The company realized that its only option was to negotiate the best deal it could get for its shareholders and finally agreed to a sale. On June 1, 1940, the city of New York took over operation of the former BMT lines. Here are some parting thoughts. As late as 1993, investors never forgot. A editorial appeared in Barron's, quote, The fundamental problem of New York, as reflected in its subway system, is the pattern of using public funds to lure private investment in fixed structures, which are then regulated into insolvency and taken over for the public to ruin, end quote. Gerhard Dahl, who was chairman of the Brooklyn Manhattan Transit Corporation, once wrote, Shall transit be treated as a business problem? Shall subways be built? Shall the people have service? Or shall cheap politics continue to block subway construction and force added discomforts and congestion? End quote. With respect to subway financing, he wrote, Who will hold the bag? To sum up the situation from the viewpoint of the welfare of the community, and not from the viewpoint of any selfish or financial interest, not from the viewpoint of the investor, but from the viewpoint of the car rider and the taxpayer, there are these fundamental questions. First, the city and the subway companies have raised and expended for building and equipping subways in the last 10 years approximately $500 million. As much, if not more, will be needed in the next 10 years. Where is the money coming from? Can the taxpayer supply it? Will he? if he can. Second, the car riders have failed to pay the cost of carrying them in the subways in the last 10 years to the extent of $84,968,800. Here he is referring to the accumulated deficit under the uh, preferentials. The taxpayer and investor together have paid this deficit the investor cannot continue to pay a similar deficit for the next 10 years. Who will hold the bag? Can the taxpayer do it? Will he, if he can? Well, this is a brief look into the dual contracts. They were responsible for building the subways as we know them today, and at the same time, 
they were an example of a failure of a public-private partnership. Thank you for watching, and please subscribe to this channel.